to days and put our days together, then we'll create a destiny. It's not just one day, not just a couple of days, not just a day here and there, but it's the days we put together back to back to back to create a destiny and a legacy in our lives. So mind you, there's one goal that we all have. Chad alluded to that last week, and that's to be formed, developed into the image of Christ. <clears throat> That is the ultimate goal. That's, the, that's what we, we've come to know Christ for. If you go back to the garden, when God made man in the garden, the first thing, the way he made him, he made him in his own image. So that's never changed. God wants us people to be in his image, and that would be bearing fruits and, uh, of, of that like. So let's look at Romans chapter 8, 29. I think Chad uh, ministered this verse last week. <clears throat> For whom he did for no, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image. Everyone say image. Image of his dear son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, um, we have pictures of Jesus, but that's just a picture. The image that we have of Christ is what's written in the word. The image of Christ is the way he lived his life. The image of Christ is what it says about him and, and how he displayed life in this world. The image of Christ is what it says about bearing fruit. The image of Christ is how we treat one another, how we love one another, how we um, deal with other people, how we deal with situations in our life. These are things that create and show forth the image of Christ, the reflection of God working in our lives. He said he predestined us to be conformed. There's always a plan of God that those believers, those were his people, would be made into his image, that he would bring us back to the very place that he started with in the garden, the image of God, man walking on the face of the earth, man walking on earth to display God's glory, God's image, God's power, God's fruitfulness, God's blessing, God's dominion, God's power, God's... Uh, in reproduction as well. God wanted all that to be displayed in the earth. That is about the image of Christ. The other day I stopped by the, the um, hadn't seen the football team in a while, the coach, I stopped by the, the um, school the other day, and the coach asked me, he says, are you preaching on Sunday? I said, yeah. He said, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm preaching on goals, or at least the process of the goals. And so I told him, I said, in football, <clears throat> the object is to reach the goal line. That's the object. Right? That's the object, to reach the goal line. But to get to the goal line, it's made up of inches, feet, yards, 10 yards, 20 yards. But, you know, it's 100 yards from one end to the other. All that makes up the process, every line, every hash mark. You could do this with anything. You could do this with a trip across the country. If you're going to go from here to L.A., then you would have... The process will be getting from here to there and all the places you have to pass through, all the uh, wonderful places, all the hard places, all the mountains, all the snow right now. If you were going to, say, if you were going to, to west right now, if you were going on 64, you would run 64, you would go 44, you may, and all those roads over there in St. Louis right now are, are completely blocked up because of snow and stuff of that nature. But there's always kind of obstacles, always things that are trying to keep you from your destination, trying to keep you from getting to the place that you want, getting to your goals, or becoming, and we're talking about our Christian life, into the image of Christ. <clears throat> now, I would hope that if we look at ourselves and see ourselves from when we first met Christ to where we are right now, I hope that our image has changed a little bit. One person has been changed a little Think about it for a second. Reflect in your memory, in your mind, in the mirror of your mind. Reflect and think, are you different than when you first met Christ? Has there a change occurred? Are you with me? Are you the same person? If you're the same person, then you didn't really have an encounter with Christ. Because if you have an encounter with Christ, He immediately enters into your life, and he be, immediately begins to work and to process you to become like him. Immediately. Some of us move faster than others. 
It's like seeds in the ground. Some grow faster than others. But the process nevertheless starts as soon as we ask Christ into our life and he begins to work in us and he begins to develop himself in us that we begin to think like him, that we should begin to act like him. We should actually begin to look like him. And what I mean by that is that when people see us, they see us acting like Christ would act. You understand what I'm saying? This is what happens to you when I get a week off. I'm really intense. But there's a goal in front of us. And the goal, number one, is to be Christ-like. That, that Christ-likeness is different than the world you came out of. The world you came out of is the world of darkness, whether you believe it or not. It's the world of error, whether you believe it or not. But... Now you're, in the wor- you're, now you're walking in the light as he's in the light, which is different. You can see differently. You, things look differently. <clears throat> I've always been a person that preaches the character of God in a person. You've heard me say this before. I don't really care how talented you are. I don't care if you could glow in the dark. If you don't have the character of Christ, then I can't really, you're not fit. You understand? You're a broken vessel. You're a vessel that's marred. You're a vessel that's cracked. You're a person that can't really be used. But if you are a person that is trying to imitate and trying to, as Paul would say, imitate and become like Christ, then you are a person that's absolutely 100% able to be used for the glory of God. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm saying that you have to be after the character after the change to be used, not just staying the same way you were. Every one of us have different things we have to fight through that we have to deal with. I've had issues over the years. Um, when I first got saved, I, I, anger it was kind of a root in my family. My dad had a terrible anger. My grandmother had a terrible anger. Anger was a thing that resided in the Peaks family. And it's been a thing that I had to really deal with. I've, I've been so angry before. When I, first, I actually hadn't been married very long. I was sitting in the car by myself, and I literally f- so upset about something. I had no idea what it was, completely oblivious to it. But I felt like I could have snapped the steering wheel in half. Maybe you've been that way before. The things that just disturbed you so much, and all of a sudden that, that, that part of you, that root that was in you that you grew up with, that, that you so desperately want to be changed, just rears this nasty head. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's bitterness. But there's things that God is trying to root out of us in this process that we would begin to be more like Christ. That is the ultimate goal. Now, there's the goals of worship. There's the goals of prayer. I know Chad talked about the disciplines. There's the goals of evangelizing and reaching out and all this. All that, all that is important. All that is very valuable. It's kind of like it's, it's a multi-pronged thing as far as this this, this thing of the goals or the, the destiny. But within all that, if we're doing all the other things and we're not measuring up to the, to the life of Christ and what he expects of us, then those, those things are just things. They're just activities. They're just, we're just functioning. So I want to challenge you, to challenge me, challenge us, that this year that our goal would be that we would see ourselves different at the end of the year than we see ourselves now. That we have made a little progress. If we made an inch on the field, we've made an inch. If we've made a yard on the field, we've made a yard. Come on. If we've made, if we made 10 yards on the field, we've made 10 yards, but we're still pressing towards that goal line. It takes inches, it takes, it takes yards, it takes feet to get to the end zone, to get to the end of the product. To get, it takes miles to get across the country. It takes days, it takes weeks, it takes sometimes months for people to get to where they're going. But the destiny is there, that's the thing we're valuing, that's the thing that's the prize before us, and we have to be in the, in the place that we will re, be relentless to get there, that we will not take a no till we get to the place God has for us, that we overcome the situations in our life that we are so desperately fighting with. 
that so desperately mar us, that so desperately keep us pinned back or, or held back or anchor us down, we need to begin to press through those things. I want you to challenge yourself right now. Think about yourself right now. Think about something that you need to start today with God that God would deal with you on. You might be a bold person today. You want, might be a person who wants to do multiple things. Well, that's great. But within those multiple things, there will be one thing that you have to deal with first. First things first, always. God called us to be formed into the image of his dear son. So there's a starting point. So if you're a believer today, you've already made your start. So from the start begins the process. The start is where the process begins. And there is no getting to the goal without going through the process, without the development, without the change. I mean, we want to go, if we want to do this thing, you've got to understand something, there's going to be change. And change is the most uncomfortable thing that you'll ever go through in your life. When I first got saved, <clears throat> we were real spiritual, and we were talking about, you know, who, who, who really wants patience in their life? Hey, yay, we want patience. Praise the Lord. Patience, a powerful, powerful character of God in our life. So everybody said, so the pastor would say, who wants patience? Yay, we all want patience. He says, get ready. Because you cannot have patience without tribulation. So if you want patience, there's got to be something to tribulate you. There's got to be something to try you. There's got to be something to test you. Because It's kind of like, do you want to get strong? Who wants to get strong? You can't get strong unless you lift something or press against something that's, that's heavier than you. You want to get strong? You have to start with weights. Come on. But you have to increase the weight to become stronger. If you don't ever increase the weight, you're going to stay in the same place. Is that right, Malcolm? Is that right, Malcolm? Malcolm's a trainer. If you want to get stronger, you got to increase the weight. If you want to run further, you got to run further. Simple as that. When I first started running years ago, I was in Hawaii with doing ministry with a guy, and we were up in a high elevation, so we took off running. And he said, well, you, maybe you can run two miles the first day out. Okay, I took off, and the first mile wasn't too hard, but I had to go back. And going back was uphill. I thought I was going to die. I was, and, he, and he's still running. He's running like five miles, and I'm like, I can't even get two. I'm going to die. But in order for me to get past the one, had to do the two, and all of a sudden, something happened to me, and I said, well, let me run three. And then all of a sudden, I was running four miles every other day. And four miles was so easy. I could run anywhere I went in the world, I would run. If I went to Africa, I'd run in Africa, Italy or Puerto Rico, wherever I, I would always run. Another, whatever state, I would always run. I could run exactly that four miles. But I would have never got to the four without running the one. You got to start somewhere, folks. If you want to change, you've got to start somewhere. So if you're going to pay a debt off, they say this, pay off the smallest debt first and then apply it to the next smallest debt and the next smallest debt. The same thing with life. The same thing if you want to change in your life. Find a thing that is the least problemsome to you. Okay? Find a theory in your life that's the least problem and deal with that one first. It's kind of like paying a debt off. And then after you take care of that one, then you move to the next one. It's kind of like climbing a mountain. You don't start at the top. You don't start halfway up the top. You start at the bottom. If you climb Mount Everest, you climb. You go through this process. And the process is a crazy process. I don't know all this stuff about it, but you have different camps you have to go to because you have to make different adjustments in your life because the, 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 the height is so high and the, and the oxygen is different, the atmosphere is different, that it could kill you if you go up too fast. And it could kill you if you come down too fast. 
So the process is, 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 is delicate. The process is important. The process is what gets you where you're going safely so that you can enjoy where you're going. So God wants us to be changed into this image. You go through this process, and we think about the goals, and we think about all the things that have to be changed, and sometimes it gets overwhelming. But can I just give you a scripture here in the book of Exodus 23? <coughs> Excuse me. Exodus 23. I will not drive. Now listen, Israel is going through the promised land. Going through the promised land, and they have these cities they have to take, these, 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 these enemies they have to defeat, which are cities and enemies are just like areas in, in our life. And he says, I will not drive them out before you in one year. Lest the Lord become land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Basically what he's saying is this. He says, I'm not going to drive them out really quickly. Because if I do, then you're not really going to appreciate what's happened. You don't have a value for what's really occurred. You can take it for granted, so to speak. He says, but, but he says, become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased, until you have grown, until you have developed, until you've really beat down that piece of ground and you inherit the land. He said, okay, we're going to go in. You're going to conquer the land, but you're not going to do it all in one year. It's going to take some time. We're going to make sure that you're, you've thoroughly defeated every area. Thoroughly defeated every area. So if you're dealing with an area in your life, it's going to make sure that that area is really dealt with. He's not just going to come down and just snatch it out of you, which would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Those of you that have tempers, wouldn't it be wonderful if you just come and just drag it out of you? Just pull it out like a tooth? Thank God. Hallelujah. No more anger. No. That's not going to work that way. Why? Because he wants to make sure that it's been dealt with thoroughly. Little by little. So it may be one thing that kind of irritates you one day. All of a sudden, you overcome that. And then the next day, something else. And, and all of a sudden, no matter what happens, you don't blow up. Wouldn't that be amazing? That whatever happens, you don't lose your cool. That would be that you now have victory over your temper. It may be easy to extrapolate, just drag it right out of you. And like, but there'd be nothing left of you. That'd be take, taking a part of you who you are away. When, when there's things that God works on in our life and we are overcome it, we know we've overcome it when something comes and touches that place and it doesn't affect us anymore. That's when we know we've overcome. That's when we know that we've touched on the image of Christ. That's when we know that we have really changed. When that thing that used to irritate us so bad, that thing that used to bother us so bad, that thing that used to just embarrass us so bad, all of a sudden it doesn't even it doesn't even phase us. That's when we know that we have become into the image of Christ in that area. He says it again over here in the book of Isaiah chapter twenty eight and verse ten. This is a great lesson just to learn in just everyday life. Little by little, little by little, little by little, little by little. I ride around sometimes, and I'm amazed at highways. I'm just amazed. I used to build highways when I was in, in, in uh, 19 years old. I know what goes into building a highway, but I see these massive highways I drive on all over the country. I'm just like, man. When they start, it's like, it looks like a mess. Right? And you're thinking, they're never going to get this done. I mean, they're moving so slow. 
It seems like it's never going to get where they're going. I wish they would hurry up, though, because we really need to get where we're going, and they cause a lot of problems. Construction causes problems. And all of a sudden, it seems like one day, there's a road there. It's like, a, there's a road. Where, how do they get? Listen, when I first moved to Suffolk, there was no Monitor Merrimack Bridge. There was no 664 when I first moved to Suffolk. I thought they were fools when they started building 664 from Bowers Hill. Because there's a lot of swamp land through there. I said, you're building a road in a swamp. Well, they built the road in the swamp. They raised it up in lower places, and they just kept on going. And, I said, and, they, and they put that tunnel over there. I remember there was nothing there. And all of a sudden, now there's something there. It changed the whole landscape of everything. It changed the whole development of the area because of that one highway there. That's the way life is when we allow Christ to move. It seems like we're not going anywhere. Have you ever felt that way you're not going anywhere? That nothing's really happening? That's like, oh, my God. I mean, like something. Jesus, do something in my life. Let I me mean, change something. Let I me mean, change, change the terrain. Change the color. Change something in my life. Nothing's really happening. I'm just like, mm, bore. I'm a boring person. All of a sudden. Boom, something different happened. Something happens in your life that never happened before. But we have to be focused on the goal within the process so that we can get where we're going. It says in Isaiah 28, 10 through 11, it says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. It's just so important. You realize it takes time. Time is the process to get to the goal, to get to the destiny, to get to where God wants you to be. Let me ask you this question. You ever frustrated with yourself? You know why? You're in the process. The process can be doggone frustrating. The process isn't what you think it's supposed to be. It's kind of like, I love the potter and the clay. It's like, hey, wait a minute. This doesn't, this doesn't, I don't like this. I don't like this. This is not what I bought into. I don't like the change. Nobody likes to change. I don't like the process. I don't like, I just like to get down the field. I just like to get where I'm going. You know, I'm that, that's the, I'm, I'm that person, okay? I'm that person. I don't like the trip. Okay? I don't like the trip. I can tell you, I don't. If you ride with me, I want to. if I'm going to New York, I'm going to New York. I've got to pass a whole bunch of places to get there, but I'm not going to stop at very, very many places. I don't care about those places unless there's food or gas there or Starbucks. I know where those places are. That's where I'm going to stop and get my food, my gas, and I'm going to do all I want but in one stop, and then I'm going to keep going. I'm not there to, 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 to le be leisurely. I'm not there to investigate the historical facts. I'm not there to see the landscape. I'm not there to look at a house. I'm on a trip. Okay? And so if that's the way I am in the natural, that's the way I'm in the spiritual. And it makes things very uncomfortable for me because I just want to get to where I'm going. I say, all right, God, listen, I'm tired of this. And he said, line up the line. Line up and line, here a little and there a little. I'm changing you. I'm working on you. I'm developing you. I'm carving on you. I'm shaving on you. I'm molding you. All right, already. I want to get where I'm going. There's no one here who feels that way, right? I mean, I've been in this thing for over 40, 40, almost 45 years. I've been walking with Christ. It's like, it never, the process is still going on. Let me tell you something. The process will go on until you breathe your last breath. That's when the process ends. <laughs> so you don't really want the process to end yet, do you? When I think about it that way, I'm saying, no, no, I don't want the process to end. But I want to stay in the process. I want to stay changing. When my kids that live with me so long recognize change in my life, then I know that something's really going on. 
When my wife recognizes a change, my wife has heard me preach more than anybody in this whole room. And my wife still gets something out of when I preach. Isn't it amazing? I even get bored with myself sometimes. It's true. You get bored with me? Oh. Thanks a lot. I mean, I can say I get bored with myself. You might say, Pastor, I heard the same thing over and over again. I heard you say it, wrap this thing in 10 different ways. And Chad mentioned just last week, he said, he said the last four, five times I've ministered, he said, I've kind of ministered on the same stuff. I've just wrapped it differently. I mean, you can do a lot of stuff with hamburger, right? You can make a hamburger. You can make a meatloaf. You can make a hamburger steak, right? You can make hamburger patties, right? You can make it spaghetti. You can put lasagna. You can, lasagna. You can make tacos. You can be Mexican. You can do anything you want to. But it's still hamburger. You can make a patty melt. You can make chili. Right? You make a sloppy joe. It's still hamburger. But the way we wrap it, what we kind of add to it, changes it. Makes it palatable. Paul constantly said through the scripture, says, I will not, I will not forget to make you remember the things I said to you before. Why? Because we need to be reminded because we're just a short-memoried people. We forget what's been said. We forget what's, what, we're, what this whole thing is about. The whole, the, this, listen, the bottom line is this. Is you are, when you come to know Christ, first thing, second thing is be changed into his image. Bear fruit after him. That's how they know who you are. If you're not bearing fruit, then something's wrong. If you're not being changed, there's something wrong. If you haven't moved from step A to step B, there's something wrong. You need to examine yourself. Consider where you're at. Consider what's going on. Consider if you're doing all the disciplines that you need to be doing to get you to the place where God wants you to be at. Fundamental things, simple things. You know, I know there's not a lot of football fans here. I'm a football fan. I'm a football guy. But I want to tell you something. And I don't know, it doesn't really matter. It wouldn't matter who won, who played last night. But listen, it wouldn't listen, listen, listen. Don't get don't get don't get your team in front of this thing. The most fundamental thing that could ever be done last night was done by the Los Angeles Rams, and that's run the ball. And that's what won that game. They weren't flashy, they weren't sure, but they did the fundamental things yard by yard, inch by inch. Come on, that's what they did. If you didn't see the game, that's what they did. That's how they won the game. If you want to win the game of life in Jesus Christ, is you have to put your feet on the ground. You have to walk every single day, one foot in front of another, dealing with everything that's in front of you, not being afraid, but being fearless and allowing God to help you accomplish and allow you to make ground up every single day of your life. Can you say amen to that? Come on. That's the way we win. That's the way we accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in life. I'm having way too much fun with this. We have to stay in this process. We never get to the goal. We never get there. Some days the walk is easy. The talk is easy. The victory is easy. The workout is easy. The diet is easy. But some days all of that is hard. Some days the walk is hard. Getting up out of the bed. I think Chad talked about that last week. And Chad, I can't believe you, 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 you uncovered me last week. Chad said, do you think pastor always feels like preaching? It's the truth. Sometimes I could work, care less if I was here. I'm serious. I am not golden people, okay? I'm not titanium. I'm not impeccable. I'm not impregnable. I am a human being, and I have to deal with the same stinking mess that you do every single day. Maybe just a little, it looks a little different, but it's the same stuff, the same crud. If you think this is easy all the time, then you're all fools. Okay? 
If you think the man that's the millionaire has it easy every day, then we're all fools. Because being a millionaire doesn't make you want to get out of the bed. Matter of fact, they'll tell you there's people, some of the richest people in the world, matter of fact, just had a whole bunch of people that just, that just OD'd over in L.A. somewhere in a rich section of town. Money doesn't make you happy. It makes you convenient, but it make you happy. There's a difference, right? Money's convenient. It's not happiness. I mean, I'd love to have a few million dollars. Who wouldn't in this room? What would you do with it? Thank you. First thing. I, listen. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm tired of hearing people's consciences about different things over life. And uh, I've been shocked at some stuff that people have told me. And I'm not going to rat them out like Chad ratted me out. Let us stay right there. No, I don't feel like it all the time. But I make myself do what I'm supposed to do. <coughs> Listen, there is this, that when Jesus comes into our life, he, be, he empowers us. Okay? The grace of God empowers us. But it also says this. It is both to will and to do of his good pleasure and that we will work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. God can't do anything with me if I don't cooperate. I'm going to say that again. God can't do anything with me if I don't cooperate. If I don't invest myself in what God wants for me, then nothing's ever going to change. He can, listen, he can drag me from here to heaven, but it's not going to change me. It might change my location, but it's not changing me at all. Do you ever see the sign, the, the, the sign, the little boy, his dad told him to sit down? You ever seen this sign, the little boy says, sit down? So the little boy sits down. But this caption pops up over his head. He says, on the outside, I'm sitting down. But on the inside, I'm standing up. If I'm standing up on the inside and resistant on the inside, it doesn't matter what I'm doing on the outside. It's just an act, it's just a show. And then when the show's going on and this stuff comes along, it really finds out if you're the real thing or not, if you really got it together, if you're really being changed, if God's really working in your life. Putting forth that effort. I, I'm loving seeing this. There's a lady that, um, uh, that, that, w that we know in... She's um, really, she's been, actually there's quite a few ladies like this that come to think of it, but, but they're, they're on these missions and they're, they're, they're trying to do something about their, about their bodies. And they're posting, you know, one's in Texas and one is here and one's down the street. And it's like, I'm thinking, well, I'm so proud of you, 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 you girls for, for doing this. And they're, but, th but once in a while they'll say, you know what, I didn't want to go to the gym today. But I made myself go, and I felt better for doing it. There's days that I don't feel like going and riding that bike that I ride 20 miles whenever I ride that bike. There's days I don't feel like going, but there's days I make myself go, and there's days that I love to go. There's days that I go that I want to go, but I get on that bike, and it's like, my God, what happened to this bike? Did somebody break it? Why is it so hard today? Everything's exact. The tension is the same. It's the same bicycle. I'm doing the same stuff. It's like, oh, my God. Uh, I've got to reduce the tension a little bit. But nothing really changed. It's just something about my body is dealing with the change that's going on inside of it. 
need to focus on the bigger picture, not on just not just you know uh, the picture of where we're at, but we need to focus on every single piece of it. I had this great idea, and I thought for sure that Google could tell me exactly this. You know, Google can tell you about anything, right? I didn't ask Alexa. I didn't ask Siri, but I figured if Google couldn't figure it out, then neither could they. But I was thinking about, you know, how many strokes are in a, in a portrait, in a picture that an artist draws. So I found this picture. I think it was about Vincent Van Gogh. Um, I think it's about the uh, Starry Night, I think it's called. I don't know, that one just came up, and I said, well, this, I wonder if Google can tell me how many strokes, brush strokes are in that picture. <coughs> I searched all over the place. No, there was no program that could tell me how many strokes were in that picture. Nothing. If you find it, please let me know, because I'm just trying to be crazy. I want to find how many strokes are in that picture. I like to find how many strokes are in any picture. But the truth be known, there's no way they can ever measure the amount of strokes in that picture, probably. I mean, they might come up with something. But at this juncture right now, there's nothing. But that picture, a starry night, go look at it. It doesn't look that great. It look that, it's, it's, not, it's not anything to knock, knock your shoes off, but it's, it's kind of like, it almost looks like something a kindergartner would do to me. You ever see a starry night picture? Yeah, it's, it's not nothing fabulous, right? To me. I mean, I'm not an art person, but you know, it just doesn't seem like that big of a deal, you know. I mean, a lot of pictures don't seem like a big of a deal. I mean, I mean for me to do a stick man is a big deal. But there's so many layers and so many different color changes in that picture. So many brush strokes in that picture. So it's not one stroke that makes your life, folks. If it was, then we'd be done. It's not just one splat on the wall that makes your life. It's not one line. It's not one event, not one season, not one thing that makes your life. There's so much that comes together that makes our lives what it is. And we need to understand that and that God is, in this grand scheme of things, God is working to formulate his image in us, his change of life in us to, to get us back to where he wants us to be. <clears throat> in Philippians 1, 6, it says this, being confident in this very thing, he that has begun a good work, he that began a good work, a good work. When Jesus Christ saved you and when you accepted that, he began a good work in you. It's not a poopy work, okay? It's a good work. It's a God work. It's a work that's going to produce godliness in you. And he will complete it until the day, until Christ comes. He's working to, through the process with you to help you get to that place of completion. Our cooperation is important in this process. For Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10, I love this one. Chad, you're going to like this one. For by the grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, listen, God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God had a plan for us before, before, think about it, before, he had a plan for you before you even knew there was a plan for you, that scares me, that's outside of my pea brain, okay, that's outside of this universe that God has something in store for me before I ever realized God has something in store for me. He knew me before the foundation of the world, people. Come on. I mean, he had this design for me. He had this desire for me to be where I'm at, to do what I'm doing. He had the same thing for each one of you. He had a design for you to be here today, believe it or not. Come on. To hear this message today, believe it or not, if you really believe in the sovereignty of God. Woo! 
Hello? That's way outside my wheelhouse. I can't even fathom that, but that's what everything indicates. We are his workmanship, us. He's building us. He's working in us. He's changing us. He's making us into the image, into the person he wants us to be. There's one thing we need to remember concerning our goal, whether personal goals or bigger picture. He is helping us, and he's working with us, and he's working on us. The time when we, allow, we don't allow God to work on us, then it just becomes us and our works. But as long as we understand he's working on us and with us and through us, then we're going to be changed into the image of his dear son. Let us remember some of the words he uses about himself in the scripture. He's the author. The beginner. He's the one that started this, the story. He's the finisher. He's the helper. He's the advocate. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the Lord. He's the potter. <laughs> he's our shepherd. He's our leader. All those things indicate that he is the one that's managing this for us. Folks, listen, you've got to understand that God wants to, wants to manage your life. God wants to manage your life. He wants to manage your life. And when he manages your life, things will be so much better than you managing your life. When I first got saved, there used to be the song that says, um, I was talking about um, driving a car. Says now it says instead of driving, I'm sitting in the back seat and leaving all the driving unto him. It makes a difference who's driving the car. Let me read this scripture here in Proverbs sixteen nine. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Make your plans if you will. But you got to understand something. Since God is sovereign, He's the Lord. He's the author. He's the developer. He's the finisher. He's the beginning. He's the end. He is the one that is ultimately going to guide you and help you stay adjusted in life. I could, I could go on and on and on today about this. But if you were to go and read in the Scriptures about some of the great men of God, Adam and Noah and Abram, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph and Jacob and Joshua and David, all these guys, there was a, there was a grand plan for them. Every one of them made a choice to, to get into plan. And then once they got into the plan, then God began to lead them and guide them. And on, honestly, if you would begin to read the stories, none of their lives unfolded probably like they thought. But God still got them to the place that he wanted them to be at. Every single one of them got to where God wanted them to be at through his plan, through his design. So I want you to think about this this morning. How is God changing you? Or where do you need God to change you? Where do you need God to enter into your life for change? I'm going to finish this message up next week on the process. The following week, <clears throat> I want you to really be here because uh, our, our folks that are overseers for our church will be here for that weekend. And uh, Pastor Richard Hilton is going to preach on Sunday morning. If you've never heard, this guy is really powerful. I want you really. I want you. To, I want you folks to become more focused this year. More focused that you really, really set some goals in your life spiritually and naturally. And allow God just to begin to build line upon line, precept upon precept. And you might think it's very, very difficult, very, very hard. I remember when we took the the um, Dave Ramsey class some years ago. We've taken it twice now. And he challenged everybody. I think the first lesson, he just throws it out there. He says, listen, I want everybody 
to get an emergency fund. Right, the first lesson, right, thinking, and he says, an emergency fund of $1,000. And I'm looking, thinking, what is he talking about? Do you think I got money buried in the backyard or something? So he challenged us inside the second or third week. He says, now listen, I want you to have your, your emergency fund together. I want you to be working towards this thing. And you know what? Everybody in the class was able, every couple, every family member, was able to gather their emergency fund over $1,000. You might think, my God, that's not possible. But you know what? Every one of us parsed together, scraped together, died to ourselves on things, quit buying stuff we'd been buying to get that $1,000 emergency fund. He said, now put it away because if something really bad happens, you'll have this money to lean back on. Everybody got that money together. It took a hard process to do that. It was a short amount of time, but we were able to do that. Then he came back a few weeks later, and he said, we're going we're gonna to calculate your debt in this class, and we're going to help you deal with your debt. Okay? Everybody in the class had debt. Some people had a lot of debt. Some people had a little debt. <coughs> I can't remember how much it was, but it was a lot, just in this small class of 20, 25 people. Came together took our credit cards out or whoever had the credit cards and started cutting credit cards up. Now let me tell you something. Cutting the card up doesn't get rid of the debt. <laughs> that just helps you start the process. If that was the case, you'd all cut your cards up right now and lay them on the altar, right? And I remember I said this at the very beginning. He said, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to start paying down your debt. Pay off the smallest card first. It's gone. The next smallest card, it's gone. And you keep going, you'll pay off all that debt. Now, when we cut those cards up, I forget how much debt we actually paid off by the end of that class. But it was absolutely mind-boggling how much when we made the commitment, we committed ourselves together. Together we became accountable that we were able to get our emergency fund. We were able to pay the debts off. And people walked out of there feeling, wow, we didn't think we could do it. But they were willing to start, what's the word? The, what, start the? To get to the goal. Okay? So you have to start the process to get to the goal. You have to start the game to win the game. Right? So I want to ask you to stand right now. I just want to challenge you. In your in your life, in your life, in your life, I want you to close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to think about a few things. Try to note them in your mind so you don't forget. Maybe write them down after you leave or maybe text yourself a message. Of something or some things that you want to start today and get in the process to complete a goal. It can be a natural thing, but I want you to also set some spiritual goals as well. <clears throat> you thinking about them right now? If you are, say amen. amen. All right. And don't forget about what they are. Because I want you to think about, as you start today, the process, that you're entering into the process and the process is not going to be easy. It's going to have some hard days. It's going to have some good days. It's going to have some ups and downs. It's going to have some flat times. But you have to start today in the process. Maybe it's an attitude you need to change. Maybe it's someone you can get, get your heart right with someone or uh, 
could be anything. You know, you could read uh, about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and find out what fruits you need, temperance, faith, or mercy, or joy, or whatever it is. You know, but you, you need to figure out what you need God to work with you on. Maybe you have a terrible mouth. Maybe you have a bad thinking. And there might be somebody, uh, some, some, there might be some men here that have a pornography problems. There might be some uh, people that have um, addictions. Or I don't care what it is, but you need to start today. Start today and start that process. And then allow the Lord to get in it with you. Allow the Lord to help you with it. And you will cooperate with Him. And you will see things begin to change. Don't be frustrated. Don't get disappointed. But you just need to keep steady plotting. Steady walking. Steady moving forward. With the, the thing that, that, that you are thinking about right now. Or the things you're thinking about right now. The spiritual things and the natural things. Maybe it is a monetary thing for you. Maybe it is a, a personal thing for you. Maybe it's a heart thing for you. Maybe it's a family thing. Maybe it's, it could be any number of issues, but, but I want you just to really think about it right now. Now, Lord, I thank you that, that Lord, you've caused things to surface in people's minds that, that you want to work on with them, and you're going to help them. You're going to get in there with them. You're going to advocate for them. You're going to... To, 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 you're going to empower them, Lord. You're going to supply their need. And, and we're going to cooperate with you, Lord. You know, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's reading the Word. Just some simple disciplines. Maybe it's really just worship. But you're going to begin to really work in our lives, Lord, because the ultimate goal is to be in the image of Christ, to, be, to, to, begin, to, to begin to look like Him, to begin to have a semblance of Him, that when people see us, they, they see us acting like Christ would. And if they see us not acting like Christ would, then they would just have grace for us and they would, they would, they would love us and cover us and, and they wouldn't judge. But, Lord, but we want to be like Christ. We want to overcome the, the world. We want to, to overcome the tribulations around us. We want to be changed into your image, Lord, which is what you destined for us. Now, Lord, we ask all this right now in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand before you leave. Hug somebody. Love on them. God bless you.